Welcome everyone. My name is Kelly Weiss. I'm the Executive Director of Marketing and Communications. Thanks for joining us today for our continued Racial Justice Speaker Series. Um, quick house rules here. Everyone will be on mute throughout the event. After our speakers have concluded, we will take questions. Those will go through the chat and you can send them to me directly and then I will pose the questions and, and um, that will be again after the talk. So it is my pleasure to first introduce Professor Mary Louise Frampton. Good afternoon and welcome to the Aoki Center for Critical Race and Nation Studies Interdisciplinary Lecture and the King Hall Racial Justice Lecture Series. Our esteemed speaker today, Dean and Professor of Law, Angela Onawachi Willig, gets double billing because she is such a superstar that everybody wants a piece of her. Uh, the Dean at Boston University School of Law since 2018, she started her career right here at King Hall in 2003. Even then, as a newbie law professor, everyone knew that she was truly special. When I invited her to speak at a symposium at Berkeley Law a few years into her career, she wowed everyone there so much that Berkeley started plotting to steal her away. That didn't happen uh, until 2016, but in the meantime, she spent many years at the University of Iowa and as a visiting professor at places like Yale and Michigan. You see what I mean, that everybody wants Angela a prolific author with three books and scores of articles under her belt. Her scholarship focuses on critical race theory, feminist legal theory, employment discrimination, family law, torts, and even evidence. With a BA from Grinnell, a JD from Michigan, and two master's degrees and a PhD from Yale, she has received literally pages of awards and had been invited to give dozens of named lectures including what I think the, um, the Derrick Bell Lecture at NYU. A brilliant and original scholar and an exceptional teacher, Angela is also the sort of colleague that everybody wants to be around, just as the late Keith Aoki was here at King Hall because of her generous and caring spirit. And now because someone as great as Professor Onawachi Willig deserves two introductions, I'm gonna pass the mic to our own wonderful Dean here at King Hall, Kevin Johnson. Thanks, Professor Frampton. Welcome to all of you and thanks for being here. Um, it's a, a, truly a great honor for me to introduce Angela Nwachi Willig. Uh, she's a legend in academia and I remember meeting her before she was a legend in academia. I remember meeting her at a faculty recruitment conference in Washington DC when she was looking for a teaching job uh, and not not quite as confident as she is today. And today she's a leading critical race theory scholar. She's also a leading critical Latino theory scholar. Uh, she's the Dean at Boston University. Uh, and so she's a tad bit busy nowadays. So we're very lucky to have her. And besides the other nice lectures she's given, uh, she also gave the Bodenheimer lecture at UC Davis School of Law. And when she left the school, it was one of the, the saddest days of my, my time here. Uh, something that I remind her of whenever I see her, and now I get to say it publicly uh, and sort of let that out there. Uh, now, she's an ideal speaker for this Racial Justice Speaker Series. Uh, she's going to talk today about the trauma of injustice. Uh, and a few years back, she wrote a, a very important article talking about Emmett Till and Emmett Till's family and cultural trauma. So with, with no further ado, I, I'm happy to introduce my friend and welcome um, in virtual space to UC Davis School of Law, uh, Angela and Wachi Willig. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dean Johnson. I, I, first, I want to thank uh, Professor Frampton for that really, really, really kind, kind introduction. And, and thank you so much for, for, um, for the, incredible, um, the incredible invitation to give this, this lecture. Uh, it's a it's an honor, of course, to be speaking at the Aoki Center. I've been I was a, a long, long fan of of Keith Aoki, and um, and I've been of course been a long term admirer of yours. And you've been so great to me throughout my career. 
uh, including that that visit really in that boost early in my career at, at Berkeley uh, at the Henderson Center. So thank you so much for all of your kindness throughout my career. Um, of course, I have to give great thanks to, to Dean Johnson, who literally I, I would not have the career I have now without Dean Johnson. Uh, he gave, my, gave me my first job. Uh, so it's great to be back home at, at UC Davis virtually, um, but also literally would not have my career at all because um, Dean Johnson, um, Dean Johnson uh, also, you know, was literally has been the most important mentor. I have a, I now have a mark in my who's literally, literally been the most important mentor really in my career, who's really sort of really guided me throughout my entire uh, junior faculty career. And I often uh, call on him often for advice um, as a dean and certainly did it as a professor many, many times. And he's been so generous and gracious throughout it all. Um, and so I, I, I won't mention any of my former colleague, colleagues, maybe I won't man mention too many of them, but I miss you all. Of course, um, professors Lewis and Evelyn Lewis and Lisa Komodo and Tom Ju and so many of you. So I, I won't mention it because I know I will forget somebody, um, but I will start um, soon. Uh, I, I, I start with this quote, um, when we heard not guilty, our hearts broke collectively in that moment. It was clear that black life had no value. Emotions poured out. Emotions that are real, natural and normal as we grieve for Trayvon and his soul and humanity. Um, and so this is a quote from, uh, Michael Denzel Smith, who's talking about how so many African Americans felt um, upon hearing right the verdict in the and the trial of George Zimmerman, who shot and killed Trayvon Martin in 2012, and who was acquitted of that killing in 2013. Um, during the opening of a plenary panel at Boston University, a, a day of collective engagement on race and anti-racism. My colleague in sociology, Professor Saida Grundy, highlighted how sociological problems actually come in cycles, repeating themselves in adapted and unadapted forms in a hundred or even fewer years. And in many of my latest research projects, I've studied, I've examined and analyzed the killing of two black teenagers whose lives have been frequently compared to each other. Emmett Till, who was lynched by two white men, J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant, plus their accomplices in 1955 in Mississippi, and Trayvon Martin, who was shot and killed by a neighborhood watch captain, George Zimmerman, who is a white, of white American and Peruvian descent in 2012 in, uh, in Sanford, Florida. Milam, Bryant, and Zimmerman were all charged, tried, and then acquitted of murder at the end of their trial. And the death of these two children, Trayvon and Till, and the lack of punishment for their killers helped to ignite two major social movements. Till's death played an important role in sparking the civil rights movement with Rosa Parks famously saying, quote, I thought of Emmett Till and when the bus driver ordered me to move to the back, I just couldn't move, end quote. Um, and as the founders, the co-founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, Alicia Garza, Patrice Coulors, and Opal Tometi have explained to us the Black Lives Matter movement grew directly out of their own responses to the acquittal of Georgia Remen in the Trayvon Martin murder trial. In one of my projects, as Dean Johnson pointed out, a few years ago, the trauma of the routine, I explored the responses of Black Americans to the acquittal in the Emmett Till trial as a means of extending cultural trauma theory, a sociological concept. Um, cultural trauma was a phrase coined by sociologist Jeffrey Alexander, who defined cultural trauma as something that occurs when members of a collective feel they have been subjected to a horrendous event that leaves indelible marks upon their group consciousness, marking their memories forever and changing their future identity in fundamental and irrevocable ways. Right, so he says it's very important to understand that cultural traumas are socially mediated processes. Um, and, and in his under explanation, he said they arise out of unexpected or shocks to the routine. That they, they arise out of things, uh, shocks to, to things that communities have come to take for granted. And he said that what matters most is the narrative that emerges from the event, not the event itself. It's not that all traumatic events or all, all shocking events become uh, tr uh, cultural traumas, 
What matters is the narrative of that narrative that emerges from the event. How is the event understood by affected communities? So my intervention in this work was to really begin to look at, well, look at how, how might that differ for particular groups uh, and in particular looking at it, how might it differ for African-Americans? Um, and I was arguing that cultural trauma to narratives can arise not only when the routine is disrupted or when there's a shock, but also when regularly expected, expected negative occurrences take place and are in fact affirmed in a public manner. And I said that there are three elements that have to exist for a cultural trauma to materialize out of an expected negative occurrence. There has to be a long standing history of a routine harm leading the, um, the subordinated group to expect nothing other than that routine trauma inducing injury. Um, that the underlying effects that are usually shocking related to the routine injury must garner the type of attention that would make a large audience take notice of that routine injury. And there has to be some kind of public discourse about the meaning of the routine harm. And in, uh, and in particular, I argue that for certain subordinated groups like Blacks and under certain circumstances, it's not the interruption of the expected that enables a cultural trauma narrative to emerge, uh, but rather the continuation of what's considered to be an expected subordination, usually through law, or government sanction that lays the foundation for the cultural trauma. Um, Alexander lays out the parts of the cultural trauma narrative, which I won't go into too much here because I won't talk too much about that. But when you're looking at what, what are the parts of the trauma narrative, you're looking at how, what gets narrated, what's the nature of the pain, what's the injury to the group, what's the nature of the victim, who's, what's the group that's affected by the traumatizing pain, What's the relation of the trauma victim to the wider audience, right? To what extent do members in the larger audience see themselves as connected to the immediately victimized person or group? Um, and who is responsible for the harm? Who's responsible for the trauma? Who were the perpetrators here? So returning to Taida Grundy's point about the cycle of psych sociological problems, I'm looking to extend my work on cultural trauma experience uh, by African Americans uh, after the Till trial by asking how cultural trauma emerges for Blacks in a post civil rights era as opposed to the pre civil rights era when the Emmett Till trial took place. Um, I'm looking at how it might emerge in response to legal outcomes that occur in what, uh, in what uh, civil rights attorney Benjamin Crump has called the legalized genocide of black people, or what I refer to as the new status quo, um, referring to sociolo sociologist Oliver Cox's 1945 article, Lynching as Status Quo, the killing of killings of unarmed and or non-threatening blacks by police officers and quasi-police officers like neighborhood watch people. So unlike in the pre-civil rights era when Emmett Till was killed, one would not expect blacks today to unquestionably presume that white people, even police officers who killed an unarmed and or non-threatening black would escape blacks without, escape, escape punishment, judicial punishment without question. In our post-civil rights era, blacks are supposed to be protected under the law as much as whites. And many black individuals have sincerely hoped prior to a trial or grand jury trials end at the police and quasi-police killers of unarmed and non-threatening Blacks would actually suffer legal punishment for their actions. So what were my methods for examining this question? Um, I have three research assistants that work with me and we're all of different, um, all identi identify different racially, um, all of their 20s, um, a, a white male, um, a, a, a Latinx um, male, a, a Chicano male, um, and an Asian American woman. Uh, I'm a black woman of undescribed age. Um, and we are all conducting interviews with individuals, primarily lawyers and law students. Um, we're looking at pe interviewing people of all races um, and we're still far from done. I still have many more many more interviews to do. Um, and uh, I've interviewed far more women and barely any men right now. Um, and my hypothesis at the outset of the project was that cultural trauma for blacks in response to police 
and quasi-police killings of unarmed and or non-threatening Blacks would by and large remain in the form of the trauma of the routine as a cultural trauma narrative formed in connection with an expectation of a continued lack of protection. And in, in part, one of the reasons why I wanted to focus on lawyers and law students as primary human subjects for my project was uh, I was thinking that, uh, that, that Black lawyers and law students um, uh, were by ba basically given their choice of education and profession more likely than any other group of African-Americans to hold a strong belief in formal systems of justice. And I could be wrong on that as well. After all, lawyers upon admission to the bar frequently take oaths that they'll in that indicate a commitment and a belief in legal systems. And were a cultural trauma narrative to emerge in the form of the trauma of the routine for this group of black, black lawyers and law students, chances are that that view and understanding would be shared more broadly across the entire population of African-Americans. Um, and because of my standing as a lawyer and a law dean, my research, my research assistant's identity as law students, um, and our easy access to law, lawyer and law student populations. Um, we, the human subjects for this project were selected through a combination of both convenient sampling, meaning a non-representative sampling of individuals who are nearest and most available to us, and snowball sampling, meaning a sampling of individuals chosen because they were recommended by the people that we initially interviewed who were nearest to us. Um, <clears throat> all right. Um, and we, we wanted to start with the convenience sample because trust was going to be really important in these interviews. We were talking about really difficult subjects. We were talking about race. Um, and in particular, we were, we were, some of us were interviewing across race, but mostly we were trying to interview along racial lines too, hoping that people would, would trust those who identified within their same racial group as well. Um, <clears throat> So while no non-Black individuals who were approached to participate in an interview refused to do so, I think it's important for me to say that several Black prospective subjects declined to engage in an interview for the study because they knew that they could not handle discussing any of the shootings and their legal outcomes, or because they knew that the discussion would be too painful. And that in itself is meaningful given part of what I'm studying as well. Um, we structured our interview um, based on a script approved through the IRB. We all asked questions based on the script. Interviews lasted anywhere from 45 minutes to 90 minutes. They were recorded and later transcribed. Um, and they were conducted in person on the phone or through Zoom. Um, some of them occurred before Floyd, the, the Floyd murder and some of them occurred afterward, afterwards. Now, based on the interviews I've conducted so far, I, I see cultural trauma emerging for Blacks in two different forms in response to the repeated non-indictments and acquittals of police officers and quasi-police officers who killed unarmed and, and, and or non-threatening Blacks during the post-civil rights era. The first is a trauma of the routine, as I just explained to you before. And the second is something that I'm calling the trauma of injustice, which arises from a different type of shattering of the expected, the shattering of the promise and narrative, uh, the promise and narrative of equality and justice that has become an important part of this nation's post-civil rights storyline. Um, the, re the response to the acquittal in this generation's Emmett Till trial, the Trayvon Martin trial, illustrates the presence of these two forms of cultural trauma among Blacks. So one saw a trauma of the routine narrative emerge through the voices of many Blacks who doubted that a jury would actually ever find George Zimmerman guilty and who then experienced that pain of that expectation of no, of no guilty finding when it became a reality and who also absorbed an understanding of what that verdict meant for the value of black life in the United States. And at the same time, one also heard and witnessed the emergence of a slightly different narrative about the trauma of injustice for blacks who sincerely hoped for a conviction of George Zimmerman, even if that was manslaughter. For example, despite a long history of killings of Blacks by white men who later evaded legal punishment entirely or received minimal punishment, many Blacks in contemporary society, including Trayvon Martin's parents, had faith that justice would be served through the conviction and imprisonment of George Zimmerman and expressed shock, disappointment, and dismay at the jury's decision to acquit. In fact, the substance of questions in my interview script begin with a question about Trayvon Martin, 
before moving on to other cases in general and end with questions about Emmett Till, right? So the first question is, do you recall where you were when you heard that Trayvon Martin had been shot or killed? And the penultimate question before the last obligatory, is there anything else you wish to share with me is, quote, after Trayvon Martin was killed, Oprah Winfrey famously said, Trayvon Martin, parallel to Emmett Till, let me just tell you, in my mind, same thing. What was the reaction to this comment when you first learned of it? And what is your current reaction to that comment? If this is your first time learning of the statement by Winfrey. Um, all right, so I wanna tell you a little bit about these um, trauma of the routine. So the trauma of the routine, remember the trauma of the routine is, as you expect that there's not gonna be any kind of, uh, any kind of conviction but of course there's still pain involved in it, right? And so the, uh, here are some quotes, first from, from um, a 39 year old black female lawyer on the acquittal of George Zimmerman. She expected there would be a charge in the case but did not expect that there would be a verdict. Um, um, and she says here, I was not expecting anything in terms of a conviction. It was not shocking to me that he did not get convicted but it was heartbreaking. So something can be both not expected and also devastating. That's what it felt like, that nothing has changed and that I needed to be afraid. I remember listening to the announcement. It was in the evening, I think several hours after the jury had been dismissed and the police were out and my son was a couple of months old. And I remember listening to it and then walking to his bedroom while he was asleep in his crib and just crying over his crib. It said to me, this could be my child, nothing has changed. I've brought a young black male into the world where someone can kill him in the street just for living and there will be no justice for him. And this was both not surprising, but also devastating. It marked a real cynicism in my thoughts about, about race in the United States. Before then, I don't think I was optimistic, but I wasn't as cynical as I became after that. So speaking with, with um, with Astrid later, um, asked her about the um, the acquittal, how she felt about the acquittal of George Zimmerman, and, and I um, and um, she talked about that um, in the previous question. And then I followed up on one one of the things that she said when she said nothing has changed. And I asked her, and I said, and when you say nothing has changed, you mean nothing has changed from when? Um, and she says, from slavery, I mean. That seems a bit extreme because obviously people are not traded as property anymore. But the sense that there are some people who are second-class citizens, the sense that black people are not fully human, the sense that white people can treat black people like they're not fully human and get away with, with it. And that people will not only let them get away with it, but that it would be considered justified, that none of that has changed. And so the optics feel different. And obviously people are not getting lynched, right? But a commitment to subordination, to the subordination of black people is still there and that hasn't changed. And the final quote I'll share with you from, um, from Astrid is again, she's speaking about what's the, I asked her about what's the impact of the repeated, um, or, or repeated acquittals and indictments in these police and quasi police killing cases. Um, and so she speaks and she says, it corrodes your sense of safety. It corrodes your faith in the, your democracy. It corrodes relationships with people who are not willing to engage the horror of these repeated incidents. And when you think about things like hypertension, depression, heart disease in black communities, and I think this is a lot of it, this ambient stress that never goes away because one, you realize it could happen to you. And two, nobody around you is talking about it until there's a gaslighting effect of it, right? Like, I know this thing is happening, but you all sit around here in the coffee room like it's a normal Tuesday, right? And so I think people understand how much it, don't understand, underestimate how much it corrodes. And the lack of sensitivity to that is a double injury on top of the actual acquittal itself. And I think people underestimate the sense of that. So one of the things I was surprised by is that this trauma of the routine, it made sense in people who were um, a little bit older, people who were in their 40s, 50s, 60s, but I didn't expect to see that anyone in their 
um, 20s would have this kind of reaction. But of course, in some ways, it makes sense um, as we see more uh, heard from more um, 20 year olds who have had that kind of reaction because they have grown up with sort of watching these videos and hearing about these cases regularly in TV. This is uh, um, um, a quote from Ifama Adoba. She's 24, I'm using pseudonyms, so this is, these are not all real names. A 24 year old black female law student whose initial response to hearing about the killing of Trayvon Martin, she said it wasn't tears, but just more of a, this is life. And I guess the quote, thank God there was some type of witness on the acquittal of George Zimmerman when she was in high school. Um, so she says, quote, I was not surprised. And again, this just goes to juries. I, I didn't have, I don't really have faith in the criminal justice system to some extent due to just seeing patterns of what occurs to those who hurt people that look like me even when there's evidence stacked against them. So I, I didn't have hopes the jury would make that change, but I think there's some things you say, oh, this is one person, this one person looks empathetic, so maybe they will. But again, you don't know what happens behind closed doors. All they need is one word, so villainize and say, yep, acquit. And then I uh, uh, follow up, what are the acquittal at the end of the trial signify to you that we don't matter? And so this is, uh, again, a 24-year-old Ifoma uh, on, on how likely she thinks it is that officers, um, uh, any future officers will be charged and convicted for killing unarmed Blacks in the, in the future. And at the time, there had only been one conviction, um, or, or um, um, two con no, one conviction of an officer. Um, um, I don't think it'll happen now. I think it may be some years. And what's interesting was the first thing that came to mind was a kid would have to be adopted. She's concocting her vision, her idea of what would have to be the perfect person that there'd have to be a conviction in this case and would have to be by a white family for it to be respected, for it to, which is crazy. But that is what first came to mind. Like that would be how, because a lot of people say that our generation is the most social justice oriented or at least the most involved in calling people out. And now we have technology, but also we've also seen that technology doesn't play a big factor in cases. So it comes down to more humanization. And then they, they would have to have so much evidence that they've never done anything in their life. Straight A student didn't look a certain type of way, probably looked more ambiguous, racially ambiguous, then, then gone. <clears throat> That's all I see, yeah. So now we're getting here to the trauma of the injustice narrative. So these are people who thought, not only thought that there would be a charge in the case, but that they thought actually there would be a con conviction. And so the, the shattering was not, uh, uh, the shattering was, was the shattering of this idea that the law would protect African-Americans as well. This is Stephanie Jen Jenkins, a 45 year old black female at attorney um, on the acquittal of George Zimmerman, she was confident that the justice system would work appropriately and there, there would be some accountability and consequence for his killer um, when she first learned about Trayvon Martin's death. So she said, um, after the acquittal, it was just horror, deep, just sadness. But this sense of powerlessness at the time, can you hear me? Sorry. Um, At the time that he, so, but as, this sense of power is because I have a son who was very young at the time. He's now approaching the age that Trayvon Martin was at the time that he got killed. I just as a mother felt powerless. It was just the most heart-wrenching thing that like I, like, I, like I said, I can really just feel how I was very emotionally distraught when that verdict came out. I mean, I really was just, oh, clearly this is not the way the law is supposed to work. I think that that was a moment that I really did get a greater consciousness of the moment we now realize that we're in, which is this Black Lives Matter moment. I think that we all developed a more acute awareness of just how far we have not come because there was a sense that we made real progress. After all, we were celebrating. We were still giddy from the first Black president. Everybody had just celebrated how far, everybody just celebrated how far we'd come. Like I said, I had brought myself out of one socioeconomic strata into a whole nother strata for my own life. The acquittal was a very stark reminder that black people were still very much threatened in the public domain simply because we were black. 
We were feared, particularly black men. That gave me real great concern as a mother, as a wife, and as a black woman, as an activist and a scholar, that we really had a lot more work to do than we all, a lot more work to do than we all thought when we celebrated the election of Barack Obama. How am I doing on time? Feel free to call me on time. All right. Um, so, so since Stephanie Jenkins, I'll probably just stop with her and said not moving on to the next person. It meant that our justice system that we are expected to put our faith in um, uh, to resolve grievances on behalf of us as citizens, our legitimate grievances was not available to me as a black citizen, right? It just didn't work for me. It meant we also can't engage in self-help because that's going to get us in trouble. Again, this is overwhelming powerlessness. It's what you're supposed to do. It's what are you supposed to do? What are you left with? You can't protect them. You can't vindicate them. You can't vindicate yourself. How are you supposed to exist in this world? It just felt so incredibly unfair, so frustrating, so overwhelmingly, like I said, it was just completely disempowering. And it's not just that juries can't acquit. It's that prosecutors fail to charge. It's that police officers cover up. That the media spins by finding a joint in the bag or finding a tape that says maybe you did something. I don't know. At this point, I guess I'm grappling with that reality. And I'm going to read her next quote because I think this is. She's talking about um, what I think is really sort of the involuntary, what I would call calling sort of involuntary intergenerational transfer of trauma, uh, effects on parenting of these cases, um, uh, and the warnings that she was giving to her son. And she's talking about the conversation she had to her son after the, the, um, the verdict in the Trayvon Martin case. And, and she said, we had to have a conversation about how you don't get to move through the world like a white boy. That's just how you get to live your life because you're not gonna be the same, given the same benefit of the doubt, you're not gonna be treated the same. The consequences are gonna be different for you and they could be deadly. I can't have that on my conscience. I need you to understand how to protect yourself. Part of it is, is not just engaging in these protective acts when you interact with the police. People talk about black parents deprive their children of the innocence of youth because we punish them and we're overly restrictive and kids should have the freedom, have their freedom. No, you deprived us society of giving our children the innocence of their youth because now we can't allow them that. I feel horrible that I cannot allow my child the innocence of youth. I'd much rather have my child lacking the innocence of youth than to have my child enjoy his youth and perhaps die because of it. I mean, I just can't make that trade off. Um, and so you, you, you see some basically some more more trauma of of the of the uh, uh, trauma of injustice. And there's another woman who's talking again about why she thought it was in second class citizenship and how sad it is. And I think I'll read her last quote and then I'll I'll stop for questions because I think I might be um, over time. Um, and she says. Um, these, and she's talking about the impact of repeated acquittals and non-indictments in police killing cases. Um, uh, and she says, these indictments do have a social impact and do have a mental health impact, I think, on African-Americans because they do send a message as to what your position is in that society. They send a message, a message as to how vigilant you, should, you need to be or should be. These all have social mental repercussions because you now perceive yourself as a second-class citizen and it can have chilling effects in wanting to be adventurous. Then it affects mental health as in like being hypervigilant causes anxiety, right? Living like that on a day-to-day -day basis, being hypervigilant, it's taxing. It's emotionally and mentally taxing. So I think these killings do have impacts that last past even the acquittal, past even when they're no longer talked about in the media. Yeah. Um, right, so basically, as I said, uh, as, I was, as I was saying, and looking at this whole trauma, this group-based trauma uh, for African Americans, um, I see these really two interesting strands. I'm interested to hear what you think. Um, one of the things I'm interested in hearing whether you think I'm right. Do you think that? Um, do you think that, for example, that it's right? Are black lawyers more likely to have a more positive view of the legal system, or is it that black lawyers and law students are more likely to have a negative view because they understand it more? 
Um, or is, do you think that's more likely to be also shaped more by socioeconomic class or other things? Um, or, or I'm curious to hear your various questions as I'm working through these issues and this project. Thank you. And once again, um, feel free to send questions through the chat to me, Kelly Weiss, and then I can pose them um, <clears throat> to Professor Anawanchi Bullock. So um, yes, well, Dean Johnson, I'm waiting to receive or Professor Frampton um, some questions here. So if, if you all want to discuss anything in the meantime, I will get those prepared. I have a question, uh, Angela. Um, what, what do you... Where do you think that African American lawyers and uh, law students sit in terms of their trust or distrust of the legal system? I mean, I have to say, I think that I mean, I I I I think that um, I would I would still go with my initial sort of view that um, African American lawyers and law students are more likely to have a greater belief in the that they can make the system work because they've made a decision to invest three years of their time studying the law and then maybe, and then spend their careers working within that field, right? They've made a decision um, to work within the system uh, and, and really work within the actual system. And so, um, and so I, I, I think actually that, that are more likely to, to at least believe in it or have a hope or desire to want to believe in it than um, the average, um, I guess, and I wouldn't say average citizen, but the average African American citizen, is what I would say. Well, then that's a pretty sad commentary, then, because it would suggest. I mean, the quotes that you read were quite sobering and make me want to cry, frankly. Um, and if that's the most optimistic group of African Americans, um, you have to wonder, gosh, what's what are other people thinking? It's because it's it's probably not. Uh, very positive. It's probably even more heart wrenching. That's true. Yeah, I think that's. I think that's true. Yeah, I think that's true. I do want to jump in here. We've had some questions come through the chat, um, and we can start with uh, this comment here that says, uh, "Someone writes, thank you. Um, excuse me. Thank you for your amazing presentation." My name is Amy Steele, and I am a 42-year-old African-American lawyer and graduate of King Hall. I think your research is spot on. Everything that you have expressed resonates with me. That was a nice comment I just wanted to share that we received. Thank you. Yes. Um, we also have some questions uh, from our faculty. Professor Raquel Aldana says, I'm wondering whether the concept of cultural trauma could also be viewed as a type of cultural healing born from the collective, social movements, visibility, et cetera. Whether it can be, so you, cultural healing. So can it, I guess I can't ask more. Read the question again. So she says, um, she's wondering if the concept of cultural trauma could also be viewed as a type of cultural healing and uses examples of uh, social movements and visibility. Oh, yeah, no, I, I see. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think that there is a little bit of cultural healing, right? Because there is, um, in the same way that, um, um, that these events, these verdicts, I think, um, like, tear or make people feel like they're further out of sight of like, uh, outside of society or less protected within society. I think it helps to, um, um, cement, not cement, or like make African Americans go closer to each other, or it's a, it's something that is is a identity unifying in a way, um, and and I think um, um, e we've seen it in all these cases. It's one of those things that brings people together in protest, right? And and in this particular moment, it, it's bringing together an incredibly multicultural group and perhaps the most multicultural group here. And so I think that there is some cultural healing and coming together in, in some ways and, and protest and, and, and creating change. And, I, and I, 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 I would say that for me, um, and I'm not one of the millennials or Generation Z people that's really out here leading this movement, 
I find cultural healing in there in watching them and seeing the reforms that they've been able to demand and, um, and, and, and have take effect um, uh, across many cities across the United States. Yeah, so I would say, yeah, I think that's right. It's a good point. Professor Frampton, was there something you'd like to add? Um, so as, uh, as the Dean at uh, Boston University Law School, um, I, I know you've given this, um, this question some thought already, but what, what do you think the responsibility of law schools is to, uh, to both expose the extent of this cultural trauma and also to, so to engage in, in the healing enterprise? Yeah, so I think, oh gosh, what, I think that there's a there's a many things law schools could do. So, um, so I mean, the 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 first thing is of course the the actual human response to it, which is to simply take note and be aware and be aware of how students in the building might be responding, right, in any particular moment in terms of how they're responding to their work. <laughs> right, and how they're able to concentrate on, I mean, all those things, right? The ways in which everything that's going on outside the world and what it's communicating to them about the value of their life to their government and their society might be impacting them as human beings, right? And as people who are learning the law, um, I think um, it should, it should um, also shape the way we teach the law. One of the ways in which we teach the law is we teach the law as though it's objective and neutral. Um, it works um, it works well for everyone. Um, we have a particular narrative that I think, um, at least that's how I felt when I was taught talk a lot. I think that's how I hear from some students, some people still continue to teach the law. And I think we have a, an obligation to, to, to challenge ourselves, all faculty, right? Challenge ourselves and, and, and ask ourselves questions about whether those things are true and to present a more, um, I think, honest picture about the law as we teach it. And then I would think um, um, Deborah Archer, who's a professor, a clinical professor at NYU, um, has written this really great article, wrote a great article where she was talking about one of the things that we also need to do. So one of the things that we do in law is, we, is that we teach students how to be great attorneys for and problem solvers for individual clients. But we don't think, we don't teach them how to look um, more broadly and think more broadly and be lawyers and who are attacking structural problems. And, um, and I think that we've got to do a better job in law schools of doing that, right? So how do we train students to look at broader problems, structural problems, um, and teach them how to be lawyers that address those issues? Okay, great. I have a question from Professor Irene Joe, who writes, can you talk a little bit about how the trauma plays out for African-American women with the added reality that much of the public protest has come to be so intertwined with the experience of African-American men? Yeah, I think that, I think that, um, I think the trauma plays out for African-American women in so many different ways, right? So there's a, there's a, the inter, there's an intersectional aspect of the invisibility of of the um, the abuse that happened the the abuse and the killings that happened to African American women African American women are also many many times more likely to be killed um, 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 you know than white women as African American men are right and and uh, and, if, and you know one of the things that you always saw over and over again as we have people have been talking about Armand Arbery and George Floyd was uh, people. Where's what about Brianna, right? Uh, where's Brianna? That was always. I mean, so people were always raising that question um, about about gender. And I remember being at um, at a at a talk, and um, actually Kimberly Crenshaw was giving a talk, and she started, you know, naming so many victims, and they're just far too many, far too many. Um, and she started with many men and people, and she sort of said, you know, I think. She either had people react or something. There was some kind of reaction where you could see the reactions once you got, she got to a name where you didn't recognize. And then she started getting to the names of women. Um, and it, it was many more people didn't know, right? Um, uh, the victims, including myself, I mean, the, the first few, right? But then after that, you know, right? And so um, there's a certain invisibility, I think, that goes on here too. But I think, um, 
there's also this responsibility. If you look, I mean, the, the founders of the Black Lives Matter women, movement are, are three women, right? And so it's interesting that the founders are women and yet women are really invisible as the victims as well. Um, but also the mothers who have really also been um, at the forefront of the, of the, of the movement, right? And starting even, of course, with Emmett Till's mom, who very bravely says, I'm going to show the world what racism looks like. And she has, you know, Jet Magazine and all kinds of Black magazines, Black newspapers publish this photo of, of his completely disfigured face and body on the pages and, and, and has the world see it, which is really part of what allows everyone to get angry. And, 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 and be, you know, many people point to that as the start of the civil rights movement, right? Um, but I think the, 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 um, the burdens that come with sort of being leaders of the movement and carrying on that torch um, 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 as mothers and uh, um, uh, um, afterwards, after having lost a child in, in that way. And, and, and if you watch many of them talk about, you know, sort of being these involuntary members of this club that nobody wants to be a member of, um, but having to do this work because they, you know, they're, they're fighting for the memory of their children, right? And, um, and fighting so that other people won't endure the pain that they're enduring. Okay, um, we have a comment question from Darby Williams, who writes, I'm a former prosecutor who investigated officer involved shootings in a major city. I am also a black woman. I find this question of trauma complicated. The reality is that some of the more challenged communities that are socially depressed have many reasons to be angry. There is an anger towards society and police. I met many police who were equally frustrated with the fact that communities they actually wanted to help were the most likely to commit acts of violence against them. How do we even begin to heal this deep divide? There is trauma in both perspectives. I can see what you're saying. There's trauma in both perspectives that, that. so I think people are angry in part by, I think there, and there's work by Devin Carbato, there's work by several people I think that talk about this cycle. What happens when certain communities are over-policed, uh, when certain, certain communities get defined as high crime areas and are over-policed and, and that the fact that they're over-policed and the police are there and there's a police presence, presence there makes it more likely that they're gonna be subject to violence, which then makes it more likely, you know what I mean, right? So it, it increases all of those things. And so, and I, I think the anger is not simply about being socially depressed, but, and the anger towards the police is also about the fact that the police are um, over-policing them and um, engaging in, a, in abuse often, right? And yet when people need help, they're also under helped, right? They're under like they're not like not also receiving the services that they want. So I think that that's part of the anger as well there. Um, and and then I think that because police are made and put in these communities and told to, uh, to over uh, uh, are placing these communities and told that this this is where you're supposed to be protecting people, you're supposed to be protecting people from these people, right? That and you're put in this situation and then you, uh, you uh, police officers come to believe certain things about the people that they're policing, right? And so um, um, without understanding the broader social context, the broader histories, all those things that brought everyone to that moment, um, um, and without recognizing how that cycle of over-policing results in the perpetuation of whatever um, stereotypes they have been internalized and affirmed, right? So I have a friend who always says, my friend, uh, Dean Carla Pratt, who's a dean at Washburn Law School always says, if I tell you that, um, if, I, if, you were to, if you were to decide that you are going, and she uses this, this particular example, if you were to decide that you're going to search nothing but um, older, you know, uh, old ladies, 
I don't know. I don't know how she's defining old ladies, but old ladies, um, and you're going to search their purses, nothing but their purses. And, and uh, every time they walk out of any kind of department, pick a, pick a department store, you're going to find some, you'll, you'll eventually find someone who has stolen something, right? Who's shoplifted or something or stolen something, right? And, um, and, uh, and that's going to affirm your view or your belief that old ladies steal, right? And you're not searching anybody else, right? Um, and I, so I think that that's part of what's going on is, right, we've got these, um, these communities that are defined as dangerous or high crime or um, engaging in deviant behaviors. Police are over-policing these communities uh, while also underserving them. Um, and then the fact that police are in these communities and, and every, however many often, finding someone who's engaged in a crime is confirming certain beliefs, but not completely absent from other communities, right? Um, I'm, I'm probably not explaining myself well, uh, uh, but I think that, I, I think there's, a, a, I, I think you're right. It's really complicated, but I think it's really complicated in other ways too, so I guess is what I would say. That makes sense. It's too bad that we can't talk because I would love to talk more with who, with uh, this prosecutor. I would love to talk more. I think we have time for one more question. I want to thank everyone who has sent comments or questions through the chat. And I'm sorry we can't get to all of your, your right. great comments. But um, we have a, a final question here from Andrea Moon. And um, they write, how can legal practitioners who work in criminal justice fields become more educated and aware of these issues and bring them into our practice analysis? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, apart from reading, um, I mean, I think reading and um, and engaging with people who are most heavily affected by, you know, reading and, and talking to people who are most heavily affected, people in over-policed communities and people talking to, and even if you talk to people in over-policed communities, I mean, you could talk to people in under, I mean, you could talk to, um, uh, if you're talking about cultural trauma, any, any, Af I, mean, I, I think many African Americans, will, this is something that cuts across all communities uh, of African Americans, because I think uh, many African Americans feel like it could be them regardless of, of where they live or who they are. Um, 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 and um, many African Americans have been subject to stops that they have felt are unfair regardless of who they are. Uh, or where they live, or what level of education they have, or you know whatever amount of money they have, and so um, I think that you could just you could just engaging and having conversations with people as well. Um, I I will stand corrected that we do actually have time for one more question, uh, which I'm glad to get in. Uh, so. We have a question from Daria, Daria who says, do you think there is any value in police officer civilian oversight agencies in terms of their role or attempt to heal cultural trauma? I, I do think so. I think, I think that if people feel, I, think, I do think that the oversight commissions you mean were for their um, review boards. Um, absolutely, I think so. I think that there is, um, when you have people who have a voice who are bringing a different insight um, and it's not um, the, the police or people who are connected to the police and work with the police and might need to rely on the police for viewing their actions, absolutely. I think it, it, um, it, it changes the dynamic and I think it, um, and, and in, it, enables, um, in, in a, it allows for some healing, right? And it might allow for some trust building as well. And I do also think truth and truth and reconciliation processes also um, help as well. Great, uh, Professor Frampton. I I see that you've had your hand up virtually um, as we're closing. Did you have anything to add? I just wanted to say um, what a fabulous presentation this is. I wish we had a whole another hour, um, and I think we would have a wonderful discussion. But we'll have to figure out uh, ways to continue this conversation. Thank you so thank much. You thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. And thank everybody for being here and hope you can make our, our next uh, lecture in a few weeks. Thanks again. Take care. <laughs>